Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, my name is Rosalind Galino, and myself and Yvette Harold are the co-presidents of the PTA Council, and we are thrilled to be able to host this event in person along with the League of the Women Voters. Before we get started, could we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we thank you so very much for those of you who've submitted questions, for those of you who have come out for the event, for those of you who are watching online, for those of you who've done some combination of all three. Uh, we appreciate everybody who took the time and the effort to contribute to the questions. Please know that we received a very large volume of questions and have done our absolute best to compile, to extract, and to make the questions reflect the desires and need of our community. Please also understand that none of the candidates have either asked for or have received the questions ahead of time. So they are going into this just as blind as we all are. Um, I thank you in advance for being a respectful, a kind, and a compassionate audience that recognizes that these four individuals are here because they want to better our community and to better our schools in any way that they feel makes most sense. And that while we may have diverging opinions, we can all be kind and respectful to each other during this event and afterwards. I would also like to turn it over to Lisa from the League of Women Voters, who will take it from here. Thank you again for coming. Thanks, Rosalind. Good evening and welcome. My name's Lisa Pizarro. I am a volunteer with the League of Women Voters of Northeast Westchester. We're thrilled to be here tonight um, as a co-sponsor with the Somers PTA Council. I'd like to thank Rosalind and Yvette at the Council for their collaborative spirit in putting together this event and thank you to the school district for supplying the venue and for live streaming and recording the forum. Um, our league officially covers Bedford, Lewisboro, Mount Kisco, North Salem, and Pound Ridge, but we've been conducting voter registration at Somers High School for several years, and we're delighted to assist with this year's in-person candidate forum. Our timekeeper, Myra, is a league volunteer, and our moderator this evening is Kathy Meany. Kathy is currently serving as both the League of Women Voters of New York State's VP of Voter Service and as president of the League of Women Voters of Westchester. Clearly her volunteerism knows no bounds as she is here tonight to moderate this forum. Um, in the interest of fairness, League moderators are prohibited from moderating um, forums in their own voting districts, and Kathy is no exception to that rule. She's a resident of Austin and does not reside in the Somer School District. Please welcome our moderator, Kathy Meany. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it, and it's a joy to be here this evening. I love moderating candidate forums. So everybody, let's have fun tonight, and hopefully you'll all, you'll all learn a lot. All right, so it's my pleasure to be here. As I said, I just want to share with you the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots political organization, and we work to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the local, county, state, and national levels. The League does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. And I want to remind you that the League, even though it says the League of Women Voters, we are actually a very diverse organization and our membership is open to everyone 16 years of age or older. Now tonight we have four candidates running for two positions on the Somers Central School District School Board. In alphabetical order, we have Desiree Deems, we have Margaret DiLorenzo, Nick Mancini and Daryl Mundus. And all have consented that they would like to be called by their first names this evening, so a little informal, which is great. I just want to review just a few ground rules. Uh, they have a list of all the ground rules. They're well aware of what they need to abide by. And as moderator, I hope not to have to stop our event this evening um, if there's any abusiveness uh, with the ground rules and to one another. So order of opening statements are going to be in alphabetical order. And then the order of response statements has already been determined by lots. 
and you'll see the change there. It'll be uh, Ms. DiLorenzo, Mr. Mundus, Ms. Deems, and Mr. Mancini. And the order of closing statements will be in the reverse order of opening. And I'll remind you of that is when we get to that point. Further questions of the mm -hmm. candidates will be rotated from the drawn lots that I just mentioned. Throughout the forum, comments of a personal or abusive nature will not be permitted, and the moderator will rule this out of order. Now, each candidate has up to 90 seconds for an opening statement. And Myra, I'll ask you when you have to hold up your sign, hold it up and make sure the candidates see it. All right? Okay, good. Candidates then have a maximum of another 90 seconds to answer each question. Each candidate, you are allowed two rebuttals of 30 seconds each. Rebuttal, there will be no responses though to the rebuttals, but you are entitled to two. And the timekeeper will indicate when we go through the opening, closing statements, and the qu answering of questions when there are 30 seconds remaining. And then the stop. Uh, let's see here. Candidates may not use text messaging, email, social media, or any other form of electronic communication during the forum. All right. And then finally, I just want to say only the videographer is authorized by the league to record this forum. And under no circumstances may candidates record this forum or anyone else in the audience. There are actually FCC regulations that we abide by because FCC regulations are the only ones, media, having the permission to parse out or segment a video. But candidates must, and the league, and uh, you know the local leagues, et cetera, the PTAs, PTSAs, et cetera, all need to distribute in its entirety. So candidates, please remember that. You can post it, but it needs to be in its entirety. All right? So if there are no other further questions, let's get started. Let's begin with opening statements. So um, we are starting with Margaret. Oh. Let's start with the opening state. Oh, no, no, no. We're alphabetical order. That's yeah, right. Desiree. Yeah. Desiree. So close. <laughs> okay, Desiree, go ahead. Well, to start, I want to take a moment to thank the PTA Council for helping put this event on and giving us the opportunity to be here as a community. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for helping to support that opportunity as well. Uh, and then before I get started, this week was Teacher Appreciation Day. I think that they are the backbone of the work that happens here, so I'd like to take a moment mm. to also recognize them. For those who don't know me, I am Desiree Deems. I have been a lifelong resident of Westchester. I have been in Somers now for 11 years. My husband and I chose this community for the school district, for the community feeling that we felt to raise our two children. I currently have a middle schooler and an SIS student uh, who are completely dedicated to their friends, their community, their teachers, and the experience that they're having. When my daughter started in kindergarten about nine years ago, I immersed myself in the school community. I felt it really important to take a part as being a mom. I was a part of SEPTA, PTA Council. I've played multiple roles over the nine years. I currently sit on SEAT, LIFE, and CWAC. They've all given me the opportunity to hear from many different community members who I wouldn't have had the opportunity to get to know. In that time, I've had the ability to work collaboratively in moving the district forward inclusively. This is why, through my extensive time and experience already, that I want to bring my knowledge ready to work on day one. Thank you very much. All right, Margaret. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Summers PTA Council and the League of Women Voters for conducting this candidate forum. To the Summers community, thank you for joining us this evening. It is a privilege to be here as a candidate for the Somers Board of Election, Board of Education, sorry. My name is Margaret DiLorenzo and I have been a resident of Somers for 27 years. My husband Gene and I are parents of two boys, both Somers High School graduates. My youngest graduated in 2022, so I've gone I've had the unique experience to have gone through all four schools and two years to reflect on that. Throughout my time when my boys were at Primrose, I took an active role in their education and extra needs. Getting to know the faculty and staff at the schools through my work in PTA and SEPTA. As a former board member of each of these organizations, I understand well the needs and priorities of 
parents, and students. After 13 years in PTA and SEPTA leadership, a position on the Somers Board of Education is the next logical role for me to serve and to give back to the community. I'm running because I hold strong feelings that our school district must honor all pathways of success. A student, student engagement, AP classes, arts, athletics, BOCES, IB, regents classes, and of course, special ed. I feel our biggest concern should be concerning securing those pathways, the safe and security of our students, continuous academic improvement and fiscal responsibility to taxpayers and for the students. My professional background in commercial real estate for 35 years has given me financial acumen and the skill set to listen, analyze, prioritize, as well as courage to ask difficult questions. Okay. I look forward to bringing those skills to the Board of Thank education. you. Thank you. And thank you, Myra, for waving us on. We appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> Feel free to say stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Nick, you're next. Great. Uh, again, uh, thank you, everybody, for setting this up. And uh, most importantly, thank you for everybody coming out today, uh, taking the time to come out and see the candidates and support this. Uh, it's great doing this finally in person and not on Zoom after many years of doing that. Um, I. Been, uh, my wife and I moved here about 17 years ago, uh, similar to others. You know, we moved here for the community feeling. Uh, we raised our three kids, or raising our three kids right now. I have three, two in the high school and one in the middle school. Uh, you'll often see me, you know, from the beginning trying to get involved, you know, in the community. I spent a lot of time on the sports fields, uh, whether it be coaching, um, active with uh, SISO, and most recently, last three years, been working on the Board of Ed and just trying to contribute to the school district. Uh, I joined the Board of Ed about three years ago to bring a, a different perspective to it. Um, I come from you know, the corporate uh, industry working in both finance and IT, uh, and I want to make sure that you know, we had a lens or a viewpoint on the board that was looking at, okay, great, what's coming out? What's coming out of the school? What, how are we educating the kids, and are we really preparing the kids for our future? Uh, in the corporate world, I've spent a lot of time um, mentoring, you know, not only, you know, New, uh, new employees coming in, building up internship programs. Uh, I do a lot of external mentoring with uh, veterans transitioning out to the workforce. Uh, so I enjoy that education piece and just trying to make sure that everyone's prepared for the uh, corporate life uh, or their, their next steps post uh, uh, high school. Um, so again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Nick. Daryl. Thank you very much. First of all, my name is Daryl Mundus. I'd also like to thank the PTA Council, the League of Women Voters, the other candidates, all of you here in the room, and those of you who are watching us through cyberspace. Um, you'll get a chance to hear a little bit more about my ideas and my vision uh, throughout the evening. But let me start by just saying a little bit about myself. Um, I'm originally from the Midwest. I was born in. Uh, out in the Great Plains, moved to Somers about three years ago after retiring from a career of more than 20 years working for the United Nations as a war crimes prosecutor and senior court administrator. Before that, I served the United States Navy in the JAG Corps for about six years, um, and service is something that's very, very important to me, has been my entire life. Once we moved here to Somers, I should also say we, I've got six kids. Um, three of whom are still uh, in school here in the district. I've got a, a, a fourth grader, a seventh grader, and a tenth grader. Um, and since retiring and moving here, uh, I've volunteered in a number of different capacities and tried to find new ways for me to continue serving. And that includes working in our, in our schools. Um, I, I saw the sign that subs were urgently needed, and I started substitute teaching about two years ago, primarily in SIS and Primrose. So I've got the experience of actually spending about two days a week uh, in our schools working with our kids. So you'll hear more about some ideas I've got throughout the evening. I'm just grateful to be here. I'm glad to see so many people in the room. And thank you again to the League for hosting us. Thank you very much. All right, so let's get started with our questions for this evening. And Margaret, we will start with you, okay. but it's the same question for all of you. Mm -hmm. What qualities do you believe a superintendent must possess in order to fit the community of Somers? And in your view, what are two characteristics of an exemplary leader? Okay, so leadership qualities. Two, two examples of leadership qualities. Okay. Um, 
Well, uh, I have been learning a lot about what a supervisor's role is, and I believe that the supervisor is the leader of the entire school district and has a responsibility to uh, really um, be able to make teachers and students and family and families and uh, all of the people that are part of the school district um, feel like they are united and have a common purpose. If you know, you're know you doing all this work and you don't have a common purpose and you're not all uh, united, uh, I feel that um, there can be some, them, some issues in dissension. So, I would say that uh, the two characteristics that are um, most important are being out in the community, which uh, our current supervisor did uh, last week. We uh, did summer soars, which was amazing, and, uh, and then attending as many uh, community events and school events as possible to really be out in the community, sending that message of unification, and we're all in this together. So thank you. Thank you very much. All right, then we have Daryl. In, uh, in my last job with the United Nations, I spent a considerable amount of my time doing recruiting and senior recruiting, and so I've got a pretty good idea what you're looking for when you're looking for someone in a senior leadership kind of position. I'm looking for really two different skill sets, uh, which have many subcomponents, but the, the most important thing is I want someone who has technical expertise in whatever it is I'm hiring for. Education is a complex, it's not as simple as standing in front of a, of a classroom and trying to teach children. Education requires um, curriculum development, facilities management, budgetary experience, a wide range of kinds of skills that you're looking for in a superintendent. So I want some technical expertise, I want some technical knowledge. Then I'm looking for some of the, 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 the skills that are a little bit on the softer side, perhaps, but are in many ways even more important than the technical skills. I'm talking about communication. I'm talking about leadership. I'm talking about integrity. I'm talking about accountability. I'm talking about responsibility. I want all of those kinds of, of leadership qualities because the superintendent, as the head of the school district, sets the example for the teachers, the faculty, the staff, and most importantly, the kids, because they're always watching. Thank you very much. Desiree, you're next. As I think of our superintendent and the role that this person plays to us, they are the leader of our community. At the core of every community are our kids and our school system. And I think that what we have to say at that is there has to be accountability. And when I think about accountability, it's for always putting forth these initiatives and giving our teachers and our students the best, the best chance possible. But when they're looking at that accountability, it's to have truth. It's the ability to say what is working and what we are doing well and what we need to be able to fix. And in that, I think, comes flexibility. It's the ability to have an open mind into what they are hearing and the information that they're getting back the feedback that parents are giving, the feedback that the staff is giving, and that open mind and flexibility to understand what they are hearing, to listen to listen, and not just listen to have a rebuttal. Um, so to me, it's the accountability with an open mind and the flexibility to make changes when needed. Okay, thank you. Nick? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna build on probably what everybody said. Look, leadership, accountability, communication, uh, that's all key, right? Uh, I, but I think the one of the big parts we talk about accountability, it's you know talking about what's going well, but also talking about what's not working, right? And having that transparency with the community uh, and being open with that and honest. You know, here's what's working, here's what's not. Here's what's not working, here's what we're gonna change. Having a plan, you know, having measures of success on that. Okay, it didn't work, let's try something new. You know, that's what you know a leader should be doing, right? And that's where you get the trust internally. You know, are we getting from feedback from the community? You know, is the community able to you know, give feedback what they're seeing, right? Is the teachers able to communicate back? Are the students able to communicate back, right? But having that complete circle of trust and communication openness to change. You know, I understand the superintendent or anybody in this role is not gonna <coughs> please everybody at once, right? But, you know, we just wanna make sure that, hey, we're being transparent in what's working and what's not, 
you know, and I think that's going to make that makes a, a great leader in addition to you know some of the other you know attributes that we talked about. Uh, communicating that you know to everybody you know is, is just as important, right? And being able to understand where people, whether it be the community or your teachers, whoever it, uh, whoever it might be, are not you know understanding what's being out there. You know, there's certain things we can communicate and over communicate. But if it's not being heard or listened to or communicated in a certain way, right, we have to change that communication strategy. Thank you very much. All right, the next question, Daryl, we will start with you. In order to complete those tasks required within the Board of Education, each of you will need to develop some understanding of the intricacies of how each element impacts the learning environment. How will you educate yourself on educational <clears throat> policy, Curric uh, curriculum trends and focus areas and state mandated services? Well, I, let me start by saying I actually enjoy learning. I, I view my life as a, as a continuous series of opportunities to learn new and important things. And there's obviously some resources available at the state level to train incoming and new, newly elected members of school boards, and I would take full advantage of those opportunities. I would listen to in terms of curriculum development, I would listen to the experts within the district and seek to better educate myself as to the curricula that we have within our schools. I would try to identify, looking at best practices, things where we could make improvements. Uh, I would look at guidelines from the not only the state, but also the, the New York State School Board Association, which publishes a wide range of resources that are available for board members. And I would go out and actively look at best practices and best policies from other school districts, not only in New York State, but in other states uh, in the country, and try to determine the best possible way to move forward with the vast resources that are available online and through other resources. But I would begin by talking to our community I would begin by talking to our teachers and our professionals uh, within our school district who actually do this on a day-to-day -day basis and find out where they would suggest I go to learn as much as I need to know to do the job effectively. Okay, thank you. Desiree. Thank you so much. Um, I think first off, as adults, we have to do what we say and we encourage our children to be lifelong learners. It's what we're hoping to promote here within the district to ignite that passion of learning. Um, I, as a parent of two children with IEPs and have had to educate myself on so much when your children don't fit a box. And in that, I have studied so much about childhood development, uh, the science of reading, Orton-Gillingham. There are so many ways to teach children early literacy and to understand when your child doesn't fit in a box, you spend your day learning from them hands-on. Being a parent has been my greatest learning. Um, they're always challenging. I take that to every decision I make. Um, outside of what I've had to challenge myself to learn when your children don't fit in the box that's happening here within the district, um, is I'm open to taking Board of Ed courses. I know that there's so many offerings through Putnam Westchester um, <clears throat> that I would be open to being a part of. I also think that so much of your learning comes from just listening with an open mind and an open heart to the community and being responsive to what is needed in that moment from them. Okay, thank you. Nick? Great. Um, so I'm going to eat my own words, right? Uh, I was elected in about three years ago, and I, I didn't come in with much knowledge, so I had a lot of uh, on-the-job training of this. Uh, I wish I came in and you know, probably was a little bit more prepared, a little bit more involved in some of the, uh, the actual you know, uh, the C committee, SEPTA, you know, and all those different uh, you know, PTA committees to be able to understand what I was doing. So I've learned a lot over the last three years. I probably, you know, I think this year I've, uh, uh, you know, finally getting to know my way around on things. Um, but look, what I've been doing over this time is I, I do. I, I listen to our administrators. You know, as far as curriculum goes, you know, they, they know what they're talking about. They do the research, you know, and I trust them to go ahead and look at that. What I want to do is just see the thoughtful process and how they've gone through and identifying the, the curriculum or changes and the research behind it and make sure that, hey, they had a great process for you know, raising that up and why we're doing it. 
Um, as for myself, you know, like I, I go out, I do you know, reading on some of the material that does come into us. I spend some time. I've reached out to um, other you know, boards, ask them how they do things, you know, what we can possibly do different. I do go on other, you know, board sites, read through some of their material to see what others are doing, how they're running their meetings. Um, I've also talked to just, you know, other superintendents that I've been, you know, introduced to just to, again, bounce ideas and get other perspectives on things. Um, so it's a little bit what I've been doing, but it definitely is. It's, it's a big learning curve coming into this here, uh, a lot more than I thought when I first got here. Thank you very much. All right, next question, we will start with you, Desiree. Oh, I'm sorry, Margaret. Thank you very much, Margaret. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for that question, and it was nice to have uh, a little moment to reflect. <laughs> uh, uh, myself, I am definitely a lifelong learner, and I get, uh, I get the itch when uh, I'm, I'm starting to get bored and I want to learn more. So uh, I, I took it on uh, this month to really dive deep into uh, all, everything Board of Ed. So I looked at uh, 312 policies that exist, and I have been you know, reading them all and just trying to kind of parse through them. And I have my top 10 policies, then I'll go over them just briefly. The first one I love is desired student outcomes. And it's interesting, that particular policy doesn't even mention test scores. These are the outcomes you want from your students, uh, the attributes that they will carry when they go out into the world. Uh, evaluation of superintendent, civility, complaints about curricula, curriculum development, determination of budget priorities, which is my wheelhouse, I love that part, plans, specifications, and cost estimates, I'm your girl, uh, code of conduct for everyone, uh, school building safety and health and safety committee. Those are the ones that I would love to dive into and really be of value to the community. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Desiree, now we can start with you. <laughs> Regarding the 2024-25 proposed budget increases, name one area that you would support the increase and why, and then also name an area of increase that you might question as a board member and why. Hard first one to be, huh? Um, so we naturally have an increase currently in our SPED budget, um, which is our special ed budget. I think that we are a district, as many here in Westchester and New York State, that have watched our declining numbers. Um, it's not drastic every year, but time over time, we are losing students every year. Um, to be understanding that just because our student population is going down, it doesn't mean the needs of our students are changing and going down as well. So I will always be a proponent of making sure that every child has what they need to be successful in our school, whether that is our special ed services, our variety of classes that we have to offer, and the variety of rooms that that is offered in. I think um, it's a no-brainer to be an advocate to make sure that that happens. Um, where I have questions and will always have questions is the ability to scrutinize um, for inefficiencies and for redundancies to make sure that our tax dollars, our hard-earned family money is going to the best sources for our children and is always child facing so that their experiences, whether it's classroom sizes or their special ed services. Sorry. Thank you very much. All right, Nick. Um, so I'm a little biased here. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, look, uh, the, the budget, uh, as a taxpayer, I would <coughs> love to see it go down. Um, you know, we've had declining enrollment over the last couple of years, uh, but we've also had record-breaking inflation over the last couple of years. Um, we've luckily benefited from that, and we've been you know, raising the budget underneath CPI. Um, I, 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 I you know, commend you know, Ray and the administration, every, all the hard work they've done on the budget. I think they've done an excellent job on that and be able to balance that over the last you know, couple of years and the way it's working. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's what I would support. You know, I, I think we do a lot of, you know, 
we can scrutinize certain things. There is definitely, we do need to continue to invest our kids, <coughs> right? We need to invest in, you know, training our teachers. I'm taking a look at from the corporate world, you know, I, I would train my employees, right? You get a lot of reward and a lot of benefit out of that. We need to continue to train our teachers on that. You know, again, we should be looking at with programs that we are, we are training them on, right? And just inspecting that, make sure they're the right things. Um, but we do need to continue to reinvest in them. So I, I wouldn't recommend pulling anything from that. Um, as with the buildings, right? There's, you know, constant upkeep. You know, we can't, with the budget, you know, you can't be very spiky with it. It's, uh, it's something that we need to maintain a, a flat line and we need to maintain a governance cycle year over year to make sure that we're investing in over that proper schedule. Um, so I, I fully support the budget. You know, I think we've done a great job over the last couple of years. And I don't think there's any one thing as a budget item that we have a question on it, <coughs> but, you know, could just continue to inspect, you know, some of the, the programs and things over time to make sure that they continue to be the right things. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, Margaret. <laughs> uh, let's see, well, I was here for the uh, budget meeting last Tuesday and the teacher appreciation night and that was a really wonderful event. Uh, I looked at the budget, I scrubbed it and I, you know, we have a 4% increase but as Nick, uh, mentioned, we have inflation also, and primarily the escalations I saw were for uh, gas, for the buses, for transportation, and health insurance costs, which ran, uh, were raised by about 14%. Uh, so that is, uh, those are big numbers, and uh, I think there's certain things we'll have to accept, uh, but we can find ways to trim uh, money and other ways, uh, I, I look forward to uh, when we start looking at the school budgets and maintaining facilities. Uh, that's something that I'm really interested in doing and finding ways to uh, trim costs for maintenance and uh, emergency projects if they come up. Um, let's see, I wanted to say that um, I think that the budget's, budget's fine. Uh, I can't see any place that I'd want to save money. Uh, may want to spend money on just the meals. I know we spend $450,000 uh, a year on meals and just want to make sure that they're nutritious and kids are getting breakfast because for some kids, this is their, this is their food sources for the day and want to make sure that the nutrition is there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Gay okay, Daryl. I've um, overseen my career, I've overseen and put together public sector budgets uh, in excess of $65 million a year. So I, I have a considerable amount of experience in putting budgets together and dealing with budgets and overseeing budgets and setting parameters on how you meet budgets and what goes into putting a budget together. And I, and I say that because I've looked through this budget as well. Um, and I don't really see areas where there are increases that I would particularly take offense at or that I would heavily scrutinize. Uh, Desiree mentioned the special ed budget going up. I definitely would support that. I think there's some increases for curriculum development in terms of science of reading uh, to comply with, uh, with some new, uh, newly introduced state requirements. I think that's very important and will go a long way towards uh, getting our reading scores back to where they, they could or should be. I think the Citizen Finance Committee that's taken an independent look at the budget has indicated that the administration has done a great job in putting that budget together. And I also want to point out that in three of the last five years, the school district has stayed within the tax levy cap um, uh, where they could have spent more under the law but didn't. And that saved the Somers taxpayers $2.6 million. So I'll echo what Nick said. The administration here has done a super job with budgeting. They've done that over the last five years. They're to be commended for that. And I'll tell you on Tuesday the 21st, I'm voting yes on this budget and I would urge everyone to do so as well. Okay, thank you very much. All right, Nick, you're up next. We'll start with you. How do you think technology should play in education in our district? Oh, nice one. Um, so, uh, look, I, I think technology, um, we need to add more of it. You know, I'd like to see a little bit more, you know, coming from a tech background, I'd like to see a little bit more of learning at the lower levels, right? Uh, whether it's, you know, coding in the early levels, you know, everybody doing Excel. Uh, I, I think, you know, I've seen, some of the best accountants, you know, in my industry that knew how to program and code, right? And they wrote their own, you know, 
programs to be able to do their work and be much more efficient. Um, you know, I've taken even some of my kids, I've you know, put them in at an early age and done some programming and coding classes as well. So I, I think it's hugely important to start integrating that in there. That said, though, too, at the same time, I think in some cases, or a lot of cases, it needs to be removed, right? Sometimes we need to disconnect from it. Our kids spend way too much time, whether it be on their phones or computers, <clears throat> right? So there's a time and place for it, and I'd like to see some of that back down. I think we have to learn how to use it, uh, but not all the time, right? Have certain classes where it is removed from there, right? Have the phones, I, I do, I agree, put them on the, put them on the wall. It's a complete distraction. Um, you know, I, I think the, the phones and the kids on them all the time right now is a probably one of the biggest detriments in the probably the over the up, upcoming years is going to be uh, something that we're going to continue to fight with the our kids ability to focus, pay attention, you know, what they're learning from social media. Um, but these are some of the things that we're going to start fighting a in the classroom to get attention from the kids and then their social emotional wellness on this. Right. So I think it's a big thing that we need to start a continue to teach our kids and then b figure out how we're separating them from it. Okay, thank you very much. Margaret. Uh, I feel uh, technolo technology plays a role in education, certainly, um, uh, especially AI. And I, that's another uncharted territory. And I think that we need to have good supervision around that uh, when we're exploring uh, different areas of that. Uh, GP chat, you can ask that, that uh, app anything and it'll give you an answer. Um, I just recently found out about it. And uh, I think that uh, you know, we just have to be careful that uh, our kids aren't uh, taking that information and uh, uh, AI chats also can write your papers for you and uh, that we're being really um, careful that they're thinking and not just uh, trying to create uh, a deliverable that the teacher wants. Um, I loved the gear shack when my boys were here. We had a good relationship with the uh, tech person at the gear shack and I, I kind of, I would like the idea of maybe if there were some students that didn't have access to internet that they could have be issued jet packs so that they can always have continuous internet at home to do their homework. And uh, that was definitely an issue during uh, COVID. And the Zoom technology, that's just outstanding. I, I'm on Zooms like all day long with work and uh, the communication and the amount of inf information that's exchanged through these platforms is mind-boggling. And so, all for technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. Daryl? Uh, the technology is great, but um, I think we've all seen this, and, and, and uh, Nick and, and Margaret have hit on a couple of these issues as well. I mean, I think it's wonderful if we can be teaching the children things like coding, teaching them the importance <coughs> of technology, teaching them how technology can make life better, how technology can help keep us connected. The problem is, particularly with the younger kids, the technology is too distracting. <coughs> uh, I, I, I can't tell you how many times when I've been in a classroom, the kids are reading on their iPads and you walk around and they immediately flip the iPad down and as a parent, you know exactly that they're doing something they're not supposed to be doing. What are you doing? I'm just, I'm reading. Okay, you're not reading. You're playing a game on the iPad <laughs> during reading time. That's the kind of thing that needs to be, to be, we need to get a better handle on. Um, I think it's really, really important as well, and, and Margaret hit on this, that the AI, um, particularly now for the older kids, with the, the problems of that. I teach down at Manhattanville as well, and I've seen students who use AI to write papers, and it's very, very difficult to wean them off of that technology once they get hooked on that, uh, having the computer write the paper for them in, in complete violation of every policy you can ever imagine. Um, so these are very, very difficult questions. They need to be uh, addressed, they need to be answered, and we need to, as a community, sit down and talk about what we want technology to do for our kids in the schools. Thank you very much. Desiree? I think I'll only build on the sentiments of the other three. I think technology is twofold. It's great till it's not. Um, one of my questions that I would have coming into the board is we are, are we run as a district where we are a one-to-one -one 
meaning all of our students have devices that are school given. Uh, K through five, we have iPads and six through 12, some of them have Chromebooks. I know it changes a little bit up there, but I'm curious as a one-to-one -one district, what professional development are we providing our teachers to use that technology most efficiently and most effectively? Um, and then the, cons <clears throat> the consistency of those platforms across the grade level so that <clears throat> teachers are consistent in the messages that they're sending. So that's the great part of technology when it's used appropriately and our teachers have the education that they need to use it appropriately. But I am a big proponent of pen to paper when it can happen. I think that writing is a lost art form. Um, I was really grateful when my kids learned to write cursive down at SIS, um, to know how to write a letter, not just speak a letter, that talk to text is writing for them. Um, so again, I think technology is wonderful when used appropriately and our teachers have the proper training and how to use it most effectively, but I'm all for a textbook and pen to paper when we can have that as well. Thank you very much. All right, the next question, we will start with Margaret. Since the Board of Education members represent every student in Somers, how will you work to properly represent and make decisions for the betterment of all Somers children? <clears throat> well, that, <clears throat> that question right there, um, sorry, I'm getting over allergies. That is to me like more of a diversity and inclusion uh, question not so much equity, but diversity and inclusion, to make everyone feel a part of a community. And, uh, you know, when my boys were in the school district, we uh, also did scouting, Scouting America, it's called now. And they did an amazing job. And I uh, kind of uh, would model myself after scouting, the way they are inclusive. They brought women into uh, the organization. <clears throat> they, uh, we traveled to different uh, cities along the East Coast uh, for scouting opportunities and camping. And, uh, <clears throat> and we explored different uh, foods and art and music. And those are the great uni unite uniters, unifiers. Uh, all of the cultural aspects can bring people together. So um, I would say that, uh, yeah, scouting was, a, was one way that we did that. And then certainly, summer sports is a great way to bring people together as either a participant or cheering somebody on your favorite team. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Daryl? Uh, our, our public schools really are a commonality for the entire community. And these schools need to be places where everyone not only belongs, but feels like they belong. We're trying to build a sense of community in, in the town, but more importantly, in the school. It starts with the, with the younger kids, the youngest kids. Building that sense that everyone has a place here. Everyone's voice counts. Everyone needs to be heard. Everyone can participate. What we're trying to do is make sure that each child each individual child is able to reach their full potential. That's what it's about, giving them the opportunity so that each child can go as far as he, she, or they can go. And so, you know, we'll probably talk a little bit later about test scores and test scores and test scores. And test scores are great. They're very limited in what they can do for us. I think we shouldn't, as a community, be satisfied until every child reaches their full potential. Some children will be proficient, some people will be, some people will be advanced, some children might not ever reach that level of proficiency that we, we seek. But if each child can reach their full potential with dignity, with a sense of self-worth, that's what it's all about. That's what we're trying to do here. And so I think it's critical that we continue to strive as a community to include everyone and to make everyone feel that they're included. Thank you very much. Desiree? Um, I think it's understanding that when you're a board trustee that you represent what is best of a community. You represent the kids who show up here every day, hopefully eager to learn in a place that they feel 
excited, and engaged. Um, I have had the opportunity to sit on our life committee, which is our learning inclusion for everyone, our seat committee, which is our SOMERS <clears throat> equity in education, and I'm gonna butcher the acronyms, I apologize, there's so many. Um, also our CWAC committee, which is our SOMERS uh, emotional, social emotional wellness committee. Um, these have all given me the opportunity to hear from community members that I wouldn't naturally cross my paths with. Uh, it's been everybody from kids younger to older in their experiences, from Heritage Hills community members who come out and have interest in touching the lives of the young kids who are here. Um, in that, I have always tried to listen, and again, listen to listen. Um, I try to be solution-based in all the problems that are brought to us. Uh, quickly, one of my biggest passions is our refresh recess. That came out of work that we did with SEPTA where we heard that kids were not being engaged on the playground. Playground is a place that all of us can struggle and when you hear or think of a kid walking around the outskirts, you just as a parent want to go and grab them and that's what we did. We created a community uh, event that happens once every other week, hopefully, in our Primrose and SIS, and we're hoping to bring it up to the middle school, where the SEPTA brings activities to help every child feel engaged at recess. Okay, thank you. Nick? Great. Um, so I, I've had the, uh, I guess, the lucky ability uh, over the last year or three years, but the last year uh, to put it into practicality. Um, so one of the things we did pilot this year is trying to get more involved with the different committees, whether it be the PTA committee, we've asked them to start joining our, our board meetings here, um, you know, working with, you know, individuals such as Desiree and making sure that, you know, we're getting input from those different um, committees that, you know, they, she sits on and others in the community do sit on. Um, one of our board members is part of the um, communication committee. You would have heard him in some meetings uh, updating the board and everybody about different events that were going on, whether it would be the arts or different PTA meetings. We had on our calendars where all the PTA meetings were along with the Zooms, encouraged our board to go out there and just you know, try to get some of that input. And we understand we all can't be there at one, you know, at all these different things, right, as board members, but we tried to put a structure in. Back to my lessons learned, right? There's a lot of things that I learned out of what worked and what didn't, right? This was a pilot of the program. I would like to see us start, you know, continue that next year and expand that. You know, how do we start continuing to set a little bit more goals for these committees? What we're trying to accomplish out of them, right? How does that funnel back up to the board and the communication coming up to the board on it? Um, so putting a little bit more of that structure so that the board does have that visibility into all these different programs that are looking at every student, right? And making sure that they're, they're involved and the board has that perspective to make sure that our vision and goal is incorporated there and being executed and feedback from the community members. They're spending their time in these meetings, working with the administration, you know, giving them feedback and having that two-way conversation, you know, and we're able to, you know, all come together and just share our thoughts and inputs and hopefully come up with a better goal and better output. Great, thank you very much. All right, Daryl, we begin with you next. How would you handle conflicts or disagreements among board members or between the board and other stakeholders within the district? <coughs> I think this question goes really to the heart of why I threw my name into the ring this year. Um, what I've seen happening at board meetings over the last year and particularly more recently is a descent into uh, a place where there's instability, uncivility, and a lack of communication and transparency. I think we need to come together as a community. We need to listen to one another. We need to avoid having cultural wars happening at school board meetings in this very room. There's no place for that in Somers. There's no place for that in our school board. We need to maintain balance. We need to maintain a district where 98% of the teachers remain, which is the case we have now. We need to avoid creating a situation of instability where people are afraid where people are looking to leave, 
where we don't know what's going on. We see, for example, the renewal of the superintendent's contract on an agenda as an agenda item, and a few hours before the meeting, that issue is pulled from the agenda with no explanation and no further communication. We need to talk. We need to talk. We need to listen. Thank you very much. Desiree? We, as, as SOMERS, are a very diverse community, and it's one of the things that makes us great, but it's also one of the things that can drive conflict. I think that at the core of everything, the understanding has to be we all show up for our kids. We all want to set our kids up for, for their next success, whatever that looks like when they leave the SOMERS Central School District community. Um, but we're not all always going to agree on how we get there. And there is going to be conflict, and we're going to look to the leadership of the community to set an example. I think one of the things as a leader is you have to set by example. One of the things that I play in my head is, and it might sound goofy, is if my kids or my dad were watching, what would they think of me? So if I play that in my head, it will always help lead how I conduct myself. It will be that I hope to be a team player and that even when we don't agree, we can respectfully and constructively have discourse to set that example to our kids that they are not always going to agree with their neighbor, but we are always going to respect our neighbor. We're always going to listen to our neighbor and not just listen, but then hope to be heard and respectfully say our opinion and hopefully come to a common way of moving the district and our kids forward. Thank you very much. Nick? Thank you. Um, look, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm open-minded and an active listener, right? Uh, there, we're going to have diverse opinions, you know, uh, in the community and the board, and we have to welcome that and be able to listen to those there and be able to have the debate and Look, one of the most unfortunate things about learning being on a school board, it's, it's a public session, right? So no matter what you say is open to the public and everybody hears it, right? So and everyone's going to scrutinize what you say. You don't have time to sit there and polish it or you don't say anything at all, right? And none of us want to sit on the board and, you know, not and just rubber stamp things, right? So people do come up and, and learn about it and going to ask questions and I encourage those questions that come up, right? I've learned a lot this year about, you know, some of the concerns of the community because of those questions, right? So it's it's conducted in a respectful way we can have conversations back and forth and board members disagreed on the on the mm -hmm. podium here we shouldn't all agree you know sometimes right again that's where some of the best you know this is what diversity is right is the different of opinions and having that diverse point of view and having uh that conversation in a civil manner and coming out with better outcomes right so I'm, i don't want to look to squash that just because you know, people have different points of view and there's some debate up there. I think it's good. I think it's healthy. I think the community coming out and talking about their concerns is healthy, right? It's going to probably change the way we change some of the communication. Okay, thank you. Margaret? Yeah, I was uh, thinking about that question, and uh, I was thinking how I, it relates to what I do um, in commercial real estate. And when we're building buildings, you can imagine uh, all of the different uh, uh, team members involved and nobody there, there's not going to be always a consensus and I would imagine that's similar to the board there there's going to be uh, different uh, points of view uh, our in, in my world it's contractual though so if the architect has an error in omission or the GC wants to charge overtime for something um, we have to uh, come together and solve that. It's nothing where you can hold a grudge and just walk away. You have to solve that now. So uh, we look at the facts, we look at contracts, and we look at law. So sometimes it's kind of pulling yourself and being objective and not having an opinion and just put it all down on the table and then it, see, it reveals itself. The truth reveals itself for everyone involved. And that's what I would like to do, these truth-finding missions to really, you know, cut through all the uh, dogma and all the preconceived notions that people might have when they have a problem trying to solve. Just throw it out on the table and, the, and it is revealed. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. May I? Yes, my 30 rebuttal. Second rebuttal? Mm -hmm. 30 seconds, please. 
I think when you speak of this, it speaks to a bigger symptom. This is a symptom of something that's going on, not only in our community, across the country, uh, however you want to look at it, but here we have to look at it for SOMERS and what we are setting to our children. I think that the system, the symptom of frustration that is playing out at our school boards is speaking to the frustration of parents don't feel heard. They feel that they're asking questions and not getting answers, and it feels very dismissive. When you listen to the board, I understand that it is a public forum and it can only be one way. I would like to look at policy as I am a trustee to look at policy to see how we can close that gap. Okay, thank you very much. All right, next question. We start with Desiree. <laughs> <laughs> see, you all get a turn. How would you solicit information from the community at large regarding conflicting views on educational, pedagogical, and ideological issues? The first is I think it happens naturally. I have been a very active member of many different committees and community programs that it's been where I get my most feedback. It's where people's guards are let down, it's an informal situation, and people are talking. Um, I think that that's so powerful. Um, I would love to bring back coffee with a Board of Ed member. I know that pre-COVID, they used to host them very unsuccessfully and unattended at the library. Um, I think that we can't be scared to hear from the community about whether we're doing a good job or not. We are here to hear from the community. When we're voted in, we are not just the voice of the people who vote for us, but for this entire community and their children. We have to open ourselves up to have that back and forth dialogue to hear what they're saying. I think in those moments, it will help calm the frustration and the feeling that parents don't feel heard. Um, it's not always gonna be comfortable, but growth doesn't come from being comfortable. Okay, thank you. Nick? Great. Um, I wish I had that magic answer this past year. Uh, but it, look, it was uh, trying to get out there in the community. It, it, one of the best ways is, is being in the groups, participating in those different committee meetings, you know, like being out in the community, whether you know, the fields, different events, right? That's where you get the most feedback. Again, we took the, the approach, the best the best place is not the board meeting, right? To have it, it's it definitely is a struggle, and I, and I empathize with with those coming here with uh, you know wanting answers and, and having that two way conversation. Uh, and we tried opening up a lot more this year, uh, having those events, you know, the the coffee with uh, some of their principals and the administration. Uh, and you know, thank you to the administration; they spent a lot of time and effort in going to those, but we couldn't get you know community members there. Um, so I, I, I don't have the, the answer right, on that. I'd look to the community and say, look, what's the best way to do it, right? How do we sit there and solicit a little bit more of that feedback, right? How do we have that open two-way dialogue where we are not in a public board session uh, where we're trying to do some of the, the uh, essentials of the board meeting in there, but how can we have an open conversation, open dialogue, and learn a little bit about, you know, again, what you're experiencing as a parent, what you're experiencing as a community member, what your students might be feeling. Um, you know, and together with the administration as well, and be able to, again, learn from that and grow and make the necessary changes on it. Uh, so in short, I don't have the answer. Uh, I'm open to it and people can email me, reach out, but reach out to you know, whoever your board members are now and whoever it is in the future, but you know, communicate that and ask that question with some ideas. Okay, thank you, Nick. Margaret? Yes, um, can you repeat the question again? I Certainly. Want to make sure I answer it correctly. Yes. How would you solicit information from the community at large regarding conflicting views on educational, pedagogical, and ideological issues? Sure, thank you. Well, you can ask my husband. I'm, uh, I'm, I volunteer too much, and <laughs> I'm like rare, rarely home. I'm involved with everything uh, after work, and uh, so uh, that's how I get my information, volunteering and getting involved in different organizations. Uh, Partners in Prevention, I was there last night and we had a really good uh, exchange of information uh, regarding uh, substance abuse in our school districts and strategies around the prom coming up and, uh, and you know, it builds trust when you show up every uh, meeting or every scheduled meeting and you show that you care about your community 
it builds trust and, and people want to confide in you. So I feel like that's a, a really great um, opportunity. And, and these uh, events always invite uh, school administrators as well. But, you know, of course people have things to do after work. Um, they do have lives, but um, I would uh, make it a point to really get involved and uh, reach out to everyone. And I am uh, in a unique situation. My boys are in college now, so I do have the time to uh, give to the community and to give to the board. Um, I've you know, I've always loved doing volunteer work, and this is where I shine. This is like the heart and soul of what, who I am. So, thank you. Thank you. Daryl? I'd like to see some community initiatives. I, I think it's really, really important, and I, I keep coming back to the reading, you know, the reading issue, because I know that's something that's on a lot of people's minds. We have a very vibrant community. Let's tap into the resources that we have. Let's determine for ourselves what our benchmarks are. What do we, how do we measure success? I don't care what US News and World Report says or Westchester Magazine or this ranking or that ranking. What's, you know, because we can look at the overall Somers reading scores versus the state and we're above the state average. We're above the state average. We're doing very well compared to New York State as a whole. But is that good enough for us? Is that what we want for our kids? What do we want? What benchmarks? What do we want? How do we want to get there? We've got a huge number of retired educators and librarians living in Heritage Hills. Let's involve those people. Let's, if we're having problems, if our kids are having problems struggling to read, and, and to be frank, I don't always see that when I'm in these schools. I know there are kids who do. Let's get that community involved. We've got a library in Reese Park. We drive by there hundreds of times a week going to sports events. How many times do you pull in there with your kid and say, we're going to the library? Let's go to the playground, get some ice cream and go to the library. After baseball, let's go to the library. We've got these things. Let's involve the community and determine for ourselves what success means because we can pull together, we can do this. This is a caring community with a lot of involvement and a lot of energy. Let's tap into it. Thank you very much. All right, Nick, we start with you with the next question. How will you work in collaboration with the administration to uphold and protect the faculty and staff of the Somer Central School District as they carry out their instructional duties? Um, <clears throat> Laura, I, I, do, I do think you know, uh, reflective, you know, the last couple of years, I, I think the board does need to take a look at, you know, some of our policies as far as how do we, you know, protect our teachers uh, and administrators a little bit more. Um, look, they're going to make mistakes. You know, uh, all of us are human, right? And as long as we can learn from them and we're not making repeat mistakes, that's the most important. But we want to make sure that we are protecting those teachers, right? We want to make sure that we're not scaring off teachers. Um, you know, we see it on the sports fields, right? How many parents yell and scream at the, the refs, right? And it's a hard thing right now to find refs for it that you know, we continue to sit there and if parents are yelling or, yeah, or uh, attacking teachers for certain things, right, we're gonna start losing good teachers, right? And that's ultimately gonna hurt our school district here, right? So as a board, we do need to take a look at, you know, potentially policies and how do we sit there and do that? I'm not sure the right answer to it, but we do need to start looking at those policies there for the teachers and administrators. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Margaret. Yes, um, you know, I've started to uh, dive into the policies, like I said, and uh, I think it's good to have, um, I would hope that the superintendent uh, would have open dialogue with all of the teachers administration, and uh, that we could um, just, I, I, I would hope that there, and I don't know the structure as it is now, but uh, I would hope that there are meetings and people are, uh, you know, having open dialogue about concerns and uh, so that they can feel supported. Because if you're a teacher or any employee, you want to be able to go to uh, leadership to feel you're heard and that your needs are being met. So I would say, yeah, I liked what Nick said about policies. I would definitely look into any policies that need to be written or revised and updated. So thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Um, the, the, the teachers and the, the staff 
and the administration is really the heart of any school district, right? We all talk, we hear corporate, you know, your human resources are your most valuable resource that you have. We need to support our teachers, we need to develop them, we need to give them further training when they need it, we need to stop attacking them. When we attack the teachers, when we attack the programs, when we have unfounded attacks on programs like the IB program, the IB diploma program, when we attack the curriculum, when we attack the superintendent, these things matter. These kinds of attacks create fear, they create instability, they drive teachers away, they drive the curriculum leaders away, they drive administrators away, and when, they dr when you drive those people away, you will drive up the costs of the district, you will drive up your tax rates, you will lead to a district where no one wants to work. And right now, that's not the case here. We need to make sure that that remains the case. We need to put on the school board people who will support teachers, who will support programs, who will stand up for what the schools are doing and what the teachers are doing and what the curriculum leaders are doing and quite frankly, what the superintendent is doing. These are good schools. Can we do better? Sure we can. Let's not attack the very people who make it all happen. Thank you, Desiree. I think as I said earlier, our teachers are the backbone of what happens here. Um, I think protecting them shows that we care. I think that the board has s taken steps in their policies in recent years to make it where no community member, teacher, or administrator is allowed to be spoken about in, in good light or in bad in public session. That, so that is a policy that I would continue to support to protect the teachers, but also look at any that we could revise or create. Um, but when I think about our teachers showing up to do a job, they have leadership that should be here also protecting them, taking accountability and ownership for some of the programs and the initiatives that they have put forth and answer the questions, whether it's the hard questions that they don't want to answer, but to understand that the community has the right to ask questions. We may not always like the answer we get, but to take ownership and responsibility for the decisions that have been made will show good leadership and in turn support our teachers to be the best teachers here. Okay, thank you very much. All right, our time is, is moving along. We have time for two more questions and then the closing statements. So Margaret, we will start with you, all right? What is your opinion of the international baccalaureate programs currently offered in high school and middle school, and do you support or not support their continuation or expansion? And are there any subjects from K through 12 that you think should be added or dropped from the curriculum? Well, I have uh, wonderful thoughts about IB, the IB program. Uh, first of all, uh, the, pay, the cost of the IB program, uh, the return on investment is like tenfold because uh, from what I've uh, studied, uh, our graduates here at Somers who have gone through the IB program are offered scholarships, you know, twenty, forty thousand dollar scholarships and uh, and not only that, they're taking college courses here at Somers, and that's money not spent out of uh, a parent's pocket when they're going off to college. You're, you know, you're, you're not paying $3,000 for calculus. They've already taken it in high school, and it was an IB class. So I, I, I can't say enough about it. And, you know, my, my boys didn't have uh, the opportunity to take part. Uh, they were on a different track. And that's another thing I wanted to talk about is, uh, the different tracks of learning um, and have, letting everyone have dignity and respect on the different tracks. So you've got your early uh, engagers, your, those learners are, that are on the fast track, they need the AP, the IB to stay engaged. If kids aren't engaged, that's a problem. I see it in 
uh, partners in prevention. You know, it, you can go down a slippery, sli slippery slope if you are a student not engaged. And so, uh, and then you have your mainstream learners and then you know you have your students that are I call it an extended track that just need a little extra and so there should be dignity and respect for all different pathways for that and then uh, K through 2 I think you said K through 12 are there any classes that we should uh, we should eliminate uh, not from what I see I'm um, I you know from from the small, you know, se uh, section. Oh, there we go. Uh, section of uh, offerings. Margaret, you're finished. All right, Thank done. you. I'm done. Thanks, okay. <laughs> Daryl. Uh, the IB program is 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 absolutely outstanding, and I certainly wouldn't do anything, anything, that would cause that pro program to be cut, to be uh, to be uh, under attack, etc. I think it's really, really important today in today's world that we teach our kids how to think critically, how to understand issues, not just how what the right answer is, but how do you get to the right answer and by the way, there might be more than one right answer out there, right? We want these kids to know how to think. AI presents huge challenges that, if, that, that we need people who understand what's going on in the world. And that the way the IB program is structured demonstrates that wonderfully. This is a way where we teach children, you know, the, the kids who are going into the IB diploma program as 11th and 12th graders take a course called Theory of Knowledge where they learn about how we understand things. How do we know? How do we know that this source is a good source? Extending that IB program, in middle years program has now been a Approved. This is a wonderful thing, I think, for those of you who were at that event uh, where the eighth graders had their capstone project, if you will, their community service project. IB is exactly where we need to be going, and I'm so grateful that these schools have the opportunity for these kids. Not all kids will take advantage of it. That's fine. But for those kids who want that kind of experience, it's wonderful that it's here, and we're a leader in that, and that should continue. Thank you very much. Desiree. Okay, unpack IB very quickly in 90 seconds, let's try. So I am for choice. I think that opportunity for all students and a wide variety of opportunity just sets our learners up for more success when they leave us. Um, I think that we are missing part of the conversation where IB is a very large umbrella. So you have our diploma program for the 11th and 12th graders. That is a choice. They can go toe in with one or two classes or they can dive in and go fully for the diploma. I think that all of those experiences, the more they touch the kids, the better they are. Where I know that the ninth and 10th grade has put in their application to now be certified, to now go for the MYP, but it is what we're doing here at the middle school. There is no choice. So when there is no choice to buy into that, what are we doing as a board and a community to ensure the success of this program? What are we giving to the success of our kids when it is no longer a choice? Whether you buy into the framework or you think it's a good idea or a bad idea, how are we supporting our teachers to guarantee that experience for all students, no matter what classroom, no matter how they learn? Um, I think that that is a conversation that we have to continue to have. And just because student A is having a wonderful experience cannot negate the fact that student B is struggling. It means we have to have a conversation as a public school district. We are here to serve every child, no matter how they show up, what our curriculum or what framework we choose. I think the PYP is in its, sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, Nick. All right, uh, look, the IB, uh, IB program at the high school, uh, that combined with the, the AP classes, yeah, I like it. Uh, I, I think it's a great program. I see a lot of, uh, my kids like the classes that are coming out. IB business is a great one, right? It offers a different perspective outside of just, you know, chemistry, math, or, you know, social studies and AP, right? A lot more of that inquisitive thinker and a lot more of those skill sets coming out. Again, you have the choice. Some could take it, some not. Definitely in support of that. I'd like to see that stay. Milliers program, look, it's a, it's a framework that we're pushing out here in the lower grades. 
Uh, it's good to see, uh, again, coming from a very structured environment uh, in technology, you know, it's good to see that structure that they're putting that framework here in the lower schools here. Want to make sure that, hey, we're measuring the success of that, right? And is it working, right? And how we're evaluating that process there. Is it really, you know, giving back to them? I loved seeing the uh, the community project that the kids did, right? Again, getting our kids, I, middle school, I took nothing but Scantron tests, right? I did a Scantron test and maybe I wrote an essay, right? And that, that didn't prep me for anything in it. These kids here actually came up and said, hey, I identified a problem. They came up with ideas and solutions. They came up and presented that, and they got to meet with people in the community, their peers, and some people from the, uh, even from the, the, the town and uh, other, um, uh, other different, you know, event, um, groups and the organizations in the community. And that was amazing seeing these eighth graders go ahead and do that, right? So anything more that we can do, more of that practical piece of it, uh, I, I think is good to expand, right? But I, I also as a board member, right, we should be asking those questions. We should be in inquisitive, you know, inquiring minds, you know, inqu inquiring to find out more, make sure it's working for us. Okay, thank you. All right, final question, and then we go into closing statements. Daryl, we'll begin with you. How do you plan to support the mental health and well-being of students, particularly in light of the social and emotional challenges they may face both in and out of the classroom? Well, I think it's, it's important to build on the, the, the program and the structure that we have now in terms of an individualized approach. I think some of the, the uh, wellness kinds of programs that we have that exist to develop, identify kids who may be at risk because of their emotional, social, or physical well-being. We need to identify those kids. We need to provide them with the support. We need to provide them with whatever counseling they may need. If they need some assistance, we need to engage the, the, the parents to make sure that everyone is on the same page. I think it's really important to take advantage of the counseling services that, that the district has to involve the parents and teachers in that process to make sure that we have an individualized plan for any child who may be at risk because of their emotional, physical, or, or mental well-being. I think that that's something that's, that's very, very critical. And to be frank, I think the, the district does a, overall a very good job in, in terms of its uh, special education programs, but also in terms of its wellness and in terms of the programs that are available to make sure that no one falls through the cracks, that all children are supported, that all children, again, feel welcome in the community, that all children have the support from whatever professional uh, uh, dis discipline is, is required for their individualized attention to make sure that each child can thrive and reach their full potential. Thank you very much. Desiree? I think this district does a great job. I know that they we have a lot of professionals within our school district who are here to help our children. I think that the whole child program is wonderful where they're not, you know, if your child is struggling academically, they're not just looking at their academics and putting them in a box. It is looking at making sure the whole child shows up ready and prepared to learn. We all know if our kid had a bad morning, they're probably not gonna have a good day. Um, but with that said, I will never diminish mental health and the need for professionals. But I also know that a confident child who has the skills, the understanding to show up and understand every day what is expected of them to be successful is going to be a more successful adult looking forward. We have to give them the skills to be proficient in their foundations, their reading, their writing, their math, so that when they come into the building, mm. they feel they have those skills to attend tasks of what they're being asked. Um, that will help build fortitude. That will help build persistence when we send our kids into the world to know that they have those skills to be successful. Um, I'm all about the foundational education because I think that that gets built upon. Okay, thank you. Nick? Um, so probably an area that I'm not most proficient in, you know, myself, but uh, doing surveys at work, one of the biggest questions that would come up is like, hey, do I have a uh, belonging or do I have a best friend at work, right? And that's the biggest thing, you know, for kids that I see is, you know, hey, do I have a group that I belong to, right? Uh, that could be, um, you know, sports or an after-school activity, uh, whether you're in a play or arts or whatever it might be. You know, I'm, I'm happy to say that we are expanding those, you know, 
pickleball is going to solve a lot of that, right? Uh, but we have the pickleball, we have tennis, right? We have a lot of these different activities that the, they've been expanding on within the district, a lot of after school, um, you know, social clubs, right? And trying to get more and more kids into that. Um, uh, again, outside of that, you know, we do have the, uh, the, the psychology and guidance department, right? That's been working on things, you know, for, for that. Again, I'm, I'm not probably that in depth with those, that, those areas there. But I'm happy to say that we have been expanding that. We have been trying to track the different uh, involvement in that, making sure that kids are involved in those after-school activities, again, whether it be sports or arts, right, just so they have some people that they have, you know, things in common with, they're connected to, and they look forward to after school and going to school. Okay, thank you very much. Margaret. Yes, I was thinking that uh, our uh, counselors in the school are on the front line and they are so important to uh, diagnose and to, to help uh, get the children um, in the right place that they need to be. Uh, so they might come to their uh, counselor with a problem at, at home or you know, maybe they got in trouble for uh, doing something they weren't supposed to do in class and you know, this is a place where, a safe space where they can uh, talk about their feelings. So, I think that the counselors on the front line of that, it, I, there are a few things that I, I would like to see. I'm just gonna put it out there. Like wellness rooms, safe places where they can, where students can go and just decompress and uh, lose some of that anxiety that they carry around with them all day long. I would love the idea of uh, some physical activity before, especially students with ADHD, can like get all their energy out before they go and sit in a classroom for a period of time. And then a little more innovation around our after school uh, program with the why. I love the why, but I felt like there could be a little more, a little something extra there that the school district could help with. And then lastly, this is my biggest pet peeve and I gotta put it out there, carpools. I think that some kids can't get to where they need to go because of car n no transportation. And why can't our district do a better job of creating carpools for all students? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we're now up to closing statements. Candidates, you have 90 seconds to give your closing statement. And as I stated earlier, we're going to reverse the alphabetical order for these statements. So Daryl, we'll begin with you. Thank you, and again, let me thank uh, thank you and, and, and the PTA Council and everyone who's here. I, I, I want to stress again the importance of where we are as a district. We're at, a, we're at, I believe, at a turning point. We need to continue to build on ideas like stability. We need stability. We need civility. We need balance. We need to make sure that the district remains on the right track. We need to ensure widest spread possible community involvement. We need to support our teachers and the administration in what they're trying to do. I believe that there are certain core values that you want or that I would want in a school board member, and these include things like integrity, vision, leadership, responsibility, accountability. These are things which I've learned and lived my entire life, from the time I went into the military until I went into service for the United Nations, dealing with people with diverse backgrounds, being able to listen to people, even people we disagree with, and coming up with common solutions to move the district forward. I think we're in a good place right now. Can we do better? Absolutely, and I look forward to having the opportunity to serve the Somers Central School District and the children of the district if I'm elected to the school board. Thank you very much. Nick? Um, so yeah, on that, I agree. Uh, stability. Uh, three years on the board uh, right now. I'm uh, recently, you know, currently the uh, president of the board. Uh, I do think we do need to be keep some consistency on this, right? Keep some uh, that learning curve is large, right? No matter how much study you can do a couple months before on this, you know, but there's a lot to learn once you get involved into this, you know. And I think it's important to choose a candidate that has been you know, engaged for the last couple of years and, and working with the, the administration and working with the, the students and, and trying to come up with ways to actually improve this. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I look, uh, again, I have a lot more I want to continue to do, right? I have a lot of stuff that I've learned that we put in place this year as kind of the, poor, the, most, uh, the pilot program. Um, so there's still, uh, there's a lot to approve and build on that, right? And totally flipping out the, the, the board uh, with the, what's existing as far as a lot of new members on it, uh, I think would be a, an overall mistake, right? Let's try to build on what we've done, what we started this year and get doing the community outreach, working with the PTAs, working with the different committee, committees and trying to improve that communication and not starting from scratch. All right, thank you very much. Margaret. All right, well, thank you to my fellow candidates here. I'm running because I hold strong feelings that our school district must honor all pathways for success and student engagement. Pathways and possibilities for students must be a priority. I'm running because the staff, faculty, and administrators in our school are, are our strongest asset and they deserve our support. Overall, our community should want to empower them to do their jobs to the best of their abilities so that they will not only guide our students to excel, but also enable this district to attract future top-notch educators. Strong and prosperous communities start with quality schools. We entrust our school board members with this great responsibility. And I just want to say I feel the weight of that here. Sitting up here, I feel the weight of that responsibility. We strive for academic vigor. I, well, I come to bring all new perspectives, sound decisions based on research and facts and law um, to all members of our community. Decisions made by this board must be made thoughtfully and I'm here to bring unity and to rally our school board together. So uh, please consider me uh, on May 21st, uh, ballot number three. Thank you. Thank you very much, Desiree. Thank you. Uh, thank you again to PTA Council and the League of Women Voters. I also want to thank the community for being here and anyone who sent in a question. I think that questions are really important. They challenge me and my own thoughts while showing me what's important to you. Um, as a dedicated Board of Ed member, I will always advocate for our student safety and our foundational education will always be my highest priority while trying to be fiscally responsible. Um, working with all to advocate for transparency, accountability, and effective communication will be at forefront. And when I make these decisions, these decisions will affect my children. My children are here. This is my community. This is where I have my roots. And I look forward to continue to serving you, not only on the Board of Ed, but all of the committees where I hope to hear from you. All right, thank you. All right, my closing remarks. The last day to register to vote is May 16th. Information about district reg registration can be found on the election and voting page of the Northeast League's website, lwvnew.org. A recording of this forum will be made available by the school district. A link to the recording will be available also on the Northeast League's website. The school board and budget vote is Tuesday, May 21st. The polling place for Somers School District voters is Somers Middle School Gymnasium, and polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. So with that, this concludes our forum for this evening. I want to thank all the candidates for participating. I want to thank the audience. Thank you all very much. And one more thing, I want to thank Myra for being such a diligent timekeeper. <laughs> And thank you again uh, to the PTA to, for inviting us here this evening. Remember, democracy is not a spectator sport. We encourage everyone to get out there and vote. So thank you and good night. You want to close? Hold on. We would just like to thank the four candidates for their frank, open, and honest, thoughtful, reflective responses to our questions, to the entire community for listening, for thinking, and for being able to make informed voting decisions on the 21st, and to the League of Women Voters for coming out and helping us make this event happen. Thank you so very much. Get home safely, and please vote.